الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم ما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي يسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير قال الله تبارك وتعالى في مقام آخر والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولا سوف يعطيك ربك فترضى صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن ولا ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ومولانا محمد مبارك وسلم وصل عليه الصلاه والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى اليك واصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله الصلاه والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا شفيع المذنبين وعلى اليك واصحابك يا سيدي يا رحمه للعالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending through and salams upon Rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Alhamdulillah we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him for his blessings especially the blessing of iman and faith and the blessing of being from the ummah of the final prophet his beloved prophet and the imam of all prophets the best of all creation sayyiduna wa habibuna muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam i pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us steadfast upon the deen and allows us to leave this dunya in the state of iman alhamdulillah as you are aware that we started a three part series looking at how our creator rabbul alamin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave divine comfort to his prophet alayhi salatu wasalam to the final prophet and his beloved prophet in times of grief and in times where one would have thought that they would have been in complete despair but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his prophet alayhi salatu wasalam gave him direct comfort and gave comfort to the ummah and the followers of rasulullah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam and we find in both the teachings of the quran the verses the beautiful verses of the quran and the life and sira of our beloved prophet alayhi salatu wasallam and his mubarak ahadith and sunna that how his teachings are also a means of comfort for all of us when we are facing difficulty and hardships and how we navigate through those circumstances that we find ourselves in we spoke about surah ad-duha in our first session and surah al-inshira in our second session and both of these surahs if you remember both of these were revealed in order to give comfort and console our prophet alayhi salatu wasalam who in that moment was going through some difficulties the pause of revelation the mocking and the taunting of the mushrikeen and at the same time the persecution that he was experiencing and his followers the persecution that was meted out to them 
and then the intensification of the torture. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these surahs in order to comfort our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers. That your Lord has not left you and he shall give you so much that you shall be pleased. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that after hardship, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ إِنَّ مَعَ الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ After hardship there will be ease. Now in our third session and final session, we find that the night journey, one of the most important and significant events that took place in the lifetime of our Prophet ﷺ, which also has a connection with divine comfort and consolation for our Prophet ﷺ. This night journey of al Isra wal Mi'raj is one of the or it is the most important night for our prophet because our prophet وسلم, on this night was called and invited by allah ta'ala and he was taken on this miraculous journey and this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes this entire journey to himself surah al-isra subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes and connects his journey to himself by saying glorified is he who took his servant, who took his abd, his most beloved servant. Laylan in a short period of time in the night, min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid laqsa. From masjid al-haram in Makkah al-Mukarramah to masjid al-laqsa in Jerusalem. And this journey is divided into three parts. One is Al-Isra, the second is Al-Mi'raj, which is mentioned in Surah Al-Najm, where from Masjid Al-Aqsa, after the Prophet ﷺ was shown some signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of his Qudra. For example, he saw Prophet Musa ﷺ standing in his grave praying, which is mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ himself becomes the Imam of all of the Prophets in Masjid Al-Aqsa. They all pray behind our Imam, uh, our Prophet ﷺ. The only place upon earth where all of the Prophets came together, from Adam ﷺ to Sayyidina Isa ﷺ, all praying behind our Prophet ﷺ. And then after this, he was taken on the second part of the journey, which is Al-Mi'raj, the ascension towards the heavens. And then meeting prophets on every consecutive and respective heaven. Then the Prophet ﷺ saw many other marvelous things. The Prophet ﷺ saw Jannah, Jahannam, he saw people being rewarded, punished. He saw angels all welcoming him. And then the Prophet ﷺ sees Baytul Ma'mur, the house in the heavens which is told that is directly above the Holy Kaaba, where the angels like the way that we perform our Hajj and go round this house, Baytullah upon earth, Kaabatul Musharrafa, in the heavens the angels circumambulate in Baytul Ma'mur. And then we, f uh, we find the Prophet ﷺ going beyond that to Sidratul Muntaha, the limit of the heavens and then third part of the journey the final part of that journey begins from there towards Lamaka where even Jibreel salam then says I cannot go any further the Prophet والسلام, through the Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taken beyond Lamaka in the divine presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has a beautiful conversation with our Rabb, which we recite in our Salah, which we remind ourselves in our prayers, every, every one of us in our Tashahud. When we sit in our Salah, we remember that. The Prophet ﷺ begins by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attributing all glory to our Lord. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in return sends salams upon our Prophet 
Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullah. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says, Salam be upon us and all of thee. Assalamu alayna wa ibadillahi salihi. And upon our righteous. So that conversation, which we remember in at tahiyat in our tashahud, we also remember in every prayer. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, As-salatu mi'rajul mu'min. Salah is the mi'raj of the believer. And there's many ways in which it is the ascension of the believer, in many ways. One of those ways is we remember the mi'raj of the Prophet in our prayer. That's one of the ways is Salat mi'raj al-mu'min. So this whole journey, and then the conversation, not only conversation, but we believe that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He blessed him with the vision. Which is mentioned in Surah An Najm, and many Sahaba Ridwanullah Ajmain were also of the opinion that the Prophet ﷺ saw Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, such as Sayyidina Anas bin Malik radiyallahu an, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu an, Sayyidina Abu Sayyid al Khudri radiyallahu an, and many many other uh, Tabi'een and great ulama of this Ummah. So all of this journey that the Prophet Ali went on. And then he was, he was given gifts as well for his ummah. All of this journey, this entire journey of Al-Isra wal miraj was for what? It was a journey of love, a journey of comfort, a journey of consolation for our Prophet Ali To console our Prophet Ali All of this journey, if we look at it, and why do we say that is because we have to look at the circumstances in which this journey took place. What happened before that, that the Prophet ﷺ was given this comfort by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we understand and what we find, one of the advices that is given by medical experts as well as psychologists, those who look at people, especially their mental health, if they are suffering from some sort of uh, depression or they're going through some, some stressful events, one of the advice that is given is that that person should be taken out of those stressful situations. That person should be taken out from that place, taken to another place. That's what the family is advised as well. So that their mind is kept away from what is happening. They're in a different environment. Take them out of that environment. Without making any resemblance. But our Prophet والسلام, in the circumstances in which Al Isra wal Mi'raj took place, the hard time that the Prophet والسلام, experienced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam for a moment. And the reason why we say moment is because time stopped when our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam was taken on this journey. And it was in a short period of time. All of these things that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam saw. This is why the mushrikeen objected, didn't they? How can someone claim that they've been on this entire journey and they have seen all of these things and they returned back in such a short period of time they couldn't fathom that so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking the prophet on this journey was to what give him comfort take him out of that situation take his mind of things and then at the same time when we find our loved ones and our family friends or relatives our dear ones, what do we do? We, we say, come, let's go. Let's go somewhere. Let's take you out. We treat them. Let's go on a holiday. Let's go have a treat. In order what? For them to forget what's happening for that moment. You want to take them out. Treat them. Again, without making any resemblance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him on this journey. Not only that, when we, for example, take our friends and families out, we buy them gifts and we give them things. 
so that they become happy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave many gifts to our Prophet this night. Many gifts. One gift that we always hear about is the Salah, which is without a doubt one of the most tremendous gifts given to our Prophet But there were other gifts also given to our Prophet And most of these gifts, if we find, there is, is for the Ummah of the Prophet. Because the Prophet know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows my beloved becomes happy when I forgive his Ummah. When I have mercy upon his Ummah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all his life, Ummati, Ummati. My Ummah, my Ummah. Always sought for his Ummah. Always sought Allah's forgiveness for his Ummah. Guidance for his Ummah. Salvation for his nation. So we find these gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which we know are, the Prophet alayhi salam mentioned in another hadith, that they are treasures from beneath the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are protective verses. The last, the khawatim of what? Surah Al-Baqarah. And there was a promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave or made with our Prophet alayhi salatu wa this night, which was also a gift that whoever sincerely from your ummah says la ilaha illallah or believes sincerely, even if he has an atom's worth of weight in, of belief in his heart, they will go to paradise. They will be given salvation. And we know uh, in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari as well as in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, the Prophet والسلام, mentions that on Yawm al-Qayyamah, the Prophet والسلام, when he will make intercession and he will be told to take people out of hellfire when, or when Allah will accept his intercession, give him permission to take people out of hellfire from uh, his ummah, when he will do so, Allah will say, whoever had a, uh, the weight of a grain of wheat of faith in their heart, take them out. So the Prophet والسلام, intercedes and they are taken out. Then the Prophet والسلام, he says, Oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. Then Allah says, take out whoever had half of that. Half of a grain of faith or the weight of that in their heart, take them out. So he'll intercede and they will be taken out. Then the Prophet ﷺ again will fall in sajda and will say, my ummah. And upon this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, take out whoever had even less than that. They will be taken out. The Prophet will fall in sajda again. he keep interceding. He will keep on doing this. At the final moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, okay, whoever has said, la ilaha illallah, sincerely take them out. And they will be taken out. So the Prophet ﷺ was given this promise by Allah on the night of Mi'raj. So this is another gift. So not only comfort for our Prophet ﷺ, but there's also comfort for the believers and his followers in this. That eventually Allah will have mercy upon, upon us. But only if we die upon Iman and die upon faith. If only we believe sincerely. So there is we find that discomfort. Now, what was the circumstances in which this journey of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj took place? About a few years before, in the seventh year of prophethood, there was a, a social boycott by the mushrikeen of the time. A three years boycott. A social boycott and this was after what this was after where when they were when the Muslims were being persecuted some of them had migrated to Abyssinia they were given permission to migrate and leave and go to where Abyssinia modern-day Ethiopia Habasha so some Muslims migrated then Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an Amirul Mu'mineen he also becomes Muslim. And then the uncle of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, 
Sayyidina Hamza, the Lion of Allah, he also becomes Muslim. So these two influential, inspiring personalities, strong personalities, they become Muslim. And then Islam begins to spread in places outside of Makkah al Mukarramah as well. People from other tribes become, also become Muslim. So all of the efforts and hard work of the Quraysh, of the Makkans at the time, the disbelievers at the time, all of the efforts in stopping the propagation of the Prophet and stopping people from becoming Muslims and turning them away, all of the persecution that they were doing, it wasn't working. Rather, people were firm on their faith or they were increasing. Now what they decided that they will assassinate the Prophet There's no other choice but to completely get rid of the Prophet and try to kill him, assassinate him. So what was decided by the beloved uncle of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Jabi Hazrat Abu Talib. He decided to get all of the Banu Hashim together and the Banu Muttalib together, the relatives and family members together. Some of them were not Muslim yet. So he got them together and he said, look, because obviously family ties at that time were also very important. This was a culture of the Arabs at the time. Tribal pride as well as family ties and joining ties of kinship. This was very important at that time. Apart from Abu Lahab, the other brothers of, or, and, and the uncles of the Prophet Alaihissalam, they also came together. And they decided that they will not allow these people to assassinate Rasulullah Because they decided they will not do that, the demand of the mushrikeen was what? Everything will be settled between us, all will be forgiven, just give us Muhammad Just hand him over to us and everything will be solved. It's because of one person we have all of these problems. But they said, no, we can't do that. So because they refused to hand the Prophet over, they then what? They forced they forced the Muslims and they forced Banu Hashim and Banu Mutlib, whoever supported the Prophet in this and protected him, they forced them into a very a narrow pass between two mountains, which is known as the Shaykh Abi Talib. And because this beloved uncle of the Prophet والسلام, whose great service for our Prophet والسلام, over 40 years protecting and being uh, the guardian of the Prophet والسلام, and in the service of the Prophet and his mission because he was the head of this the whole valley and pass that narrow pass is named after him. Now, this three years of social boycott, the Mushrikeen wrote a document sanctioning and putting what they wrote on this document was what the clauses of it in this boycott. There were four particular clauses. Number one, that no one is allowed to marry with the, into these people. No marriage is allowed with these people. Number two, no one shall trade or do business with them. No one shall talk with them or socialize with them. And number four, no one shall give them any sort of food or drink. So the food and drink is stopped. Business dealing is stopped. No one is allowed to socialize or talk to them. And no one is allowed to marry within them. This was the conditions or the, or the sanctions that were put and this document that was written, it was put into in, in, in the Holy Kaaba. So the people who would come to visit, they would tell them as well that these people, nothing, you have nothing to do with them. 
Now, these were very difficult three years. A social boycott by the people, a very difficult three years. No food, no drink. And it's, it's related in the books of Sirah that there was so much suffering. That the people were eating leaves. They were boiling and eating leaves. So much so that their mouths had, had developed ulcers in their mouth because of what they were eating. Some Sahaba described that if they, they would find skins of dead animals and that's what they were eating and what they would do is they would soak up if they would find a piece of skin of an animal they would soak it into water and they would suck on that in order to relieve their hunger and thirst and they would share that as well just to relieve that thirst and hunger or they would find pieces of skin, they would cut it into pieces and, and, and eat it over many days. So imagine how many pieces they would need to make of a small piece of skin. The children could be heard crying, the echoes of suffering and crying could be heard in the mountains. But these people, they were not moved. But there were some people amongst the Makkans amongst the, uh, the, the Quraysh, there were some people, even though they were not Muslim, there were some people who had mercy in their hearts. They wanted this to stop. They said, look, how can we make these people suffer? And, you know, something that we can relate to, something that is happening now. For example, in Palestine, we find that because of the occupation and because of uh, this brutality, this oppression and tyranny, this zulm that's taking place in this moment for many months now. The blockade, the stopping of food, water, electricity. You can find how much those people are suffering. When you cut everything off, no food is allowed, no drink is allowed, the water supply is switched, electricity is switched off. There's no telecommunication with the outside world. They can't communicate with the people outside. How would they be surviving? Then on top of that, the bombs that are being dropped on them, the callous killing, without any mercy. So you can imagine the, these people not having any... And then there are people who are across the world who are seeing that suffering and they want to do something. But they are feeling hopeless. How can we help these people? How can we get this in? But they are powerful entities and they are powerful people who are not allowing to happen. Some of them haven't even called for a ceasefire. They're not even so, and they can, but they're not. So when this three years of social boycott, what was happening, you can understand the anger in some of the people who had a heart, who had mercy. And then there were the elite who didn't care. They only had one thing in mind. We need to get rid of these people. So after three years of suffering, we can't go into much detail because we don't have time. The Prophet والسلام, he receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala tells him that the document that they have written, that document has been, Allah has sent some termites or ants that have eaten up that document and only the name of Allah Wherever it said Allah, only that remains, the rest of the writing is completely gone. So when the Prophet is told this, the Prophet calls his followers and calls his uncle. And he said, this is what Allah has told me. The Prophet beloved uncle, he says, this is one of, he believed in him. He said, you are Sadiq and you are Amin. You've never told a lie. So he calls the Makkan leaders, the mushrikeen, and he says to them, there is a way in which we can reconcile, and there is a way that we can come to an agreement. The mushrikeen are thinking, at last, three years of this suffering, now they're willing to give up the Prophet. We're ready to listen to anything you say, any condition that you put. So the beloved uncle of the Prophet ﷺ says 
that my nephew, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, he has said that this document that you have written regarding our social boycott and the sanctions that you have put, it has been eaten up by termites. And the only thing that remains on it is the name of Allah. And if he is right, and I believe he's right, if he is right, then you must finish all this and we will and don't demand us to hand the Prophet over. But if he is wrong, then we will hand you over himself. We will hand him over ourselves. They're happy. They say, why not? Quickly go and get that document. When they bring that document, because it was enclosed, it was wrapped up. When they open it, it was as the Prophet ﷺ said. It was as the Prophet ﷺ said. So now that boycott has to finish because there's nothing written on the document. It's completely finished. And per agreement, they should have released them from that boycott and would have stopped their demand and allow the Prophet ﷺ to be safe. But what did they say in return? This is magic. This is your nephew's magic. This is what we're telling the people. Don't listen to him. Because he's a magician. He's a sorcerer. So when they did this, when they turned back on their agreement, those people who already were saying, you should stop this, this is inhumane, they then became enraged. They then actively said, we're not going to allow you to continue this anymore. You best stop this. So those people now became very... Uh, even more in, uh, enraged and, and, and there was about to be a, a physical altercation between them. Now, they, you must stop this now. You turn back on your agreement. So that was the only way in which that social boycott was finished. But the mushrikeen still wanted to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. So now what they did, they allowed them to come out of that, uh, from that valley they increased their persecution. They increased their torture and their persecution. So this was the first thing that happened, the three years of social boycott. That was the first circumstance, three years of suffering, hardship. And then in that same year when the boycott finished, two beloved people of the Prophet ﷺ passed away in the same year, one after the other, and not many uh, days or weeks between them. Some have said after three days, some have said after a month, some have said after 20 days, or some have said after three months. So within that same year, the 10th year of the prophethood. And this year then became to be known as Amul Huzn, the year of grief. The year of grief. Who were these two beloved people that passed away in this? The beloved uncle of our Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. The one who protected, uh, who, whom Allah made a means of protection. And, and the one who guarded our Prophet, ﷺ, not just with his own life, but he guarded the Prophet, ﷺ, even with the lives of his own children. When they were in that uh, valley, at night, what used to happen? The Prophet, ﷺ's uncle, would tell him, sleep uh, in, your, in, in your space. So that the people see you that you've slept there. But then during the middle of the night, the Prophet he would tell the Prophet to move and he would put one of his own sons there. So if someone was to come and attack, they would attack my son and not my nephew. This is the love that he had for the Prophet the beloved uncle of the Prophet Sayyidina Abu Talib. May Allah have mercy on him and be pleased with him. Now, in terms of something that I want to mention here, the Prophet ﷺ uncle leaves this world and in regards to his faith, we, we shouldn't discuss this in, in a manner which is not befitting. So, for example, what we say is that there is a disagreement upon the faith and the iman of the beloved uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. There is a disagreement amongst the ulama. The mutaqaddimin, the earlier scholars, used to negate it. But 
the latter scholars and contemporary ulama, they affirm it. They say there, there was faith. The earlier scholars, they used to negate it. The most safest position to take, the most safest, is remain silent. That's the most safest position to take. Remain silent upon this issue. You should not say anything. The ones who negate should not bring it to their tongue. Anything that would hurt our Prophet ﷺ. Because our deeds are presented to the Prophet. Our deeds are seen by our Prophet ﷺ. Imagine if one is speaking ill about the beloved of the Prophet. Imagine if someone is saying things about the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, which will hurt our Prophet. One, you would come under the one who causes harm to Allah and his prophet la'na of them upon them in this dunya and the akhirah or if the prophet is you are upsetting our prophet by saying things about his uncle in a way that would not befit him then this is causing harm to our prophet so because of the prophet we shouldn't say anything so you should remain silent upon that if those who are not believing negating that and those who are affirming, then whilst affirming, do not say things about which we don't know. That's the safest position to take. Because Allah Allah knows best. Allah and His Rasul know best. So do not force people to believe and then do not force people to negate. That's the safest position to take, the middle position to remain silent upon this issue. Although personally, personally, my own opinion and what my heart is inclined towards is that he did believe. He did have Iman. He did believe. If you look at the whole life and the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, from the time that the Prophet ﷺ was born, came into this world, from the time when he was, a, he was young and a child, all of that, there are so many signs. There are so many alamat. There are so many karain that are testimony to this, that he did have faith in his heart. He did believe that the Prophet ﷺ was a prophet. And there's many in the, over those 40 years, he witnessed those things. That's why he was with the Prophet all of this time. And some of those shawahid are this, that for example, I'm not going to go through into any detail with this, but just to give you one example, whilst being on the last phases of his life, one of the last things he said to the Quraysh, one of the last things he said to the, the Mushrikeen, to uh, Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, the last things that he said on his deathbed was what? He said, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh ibn Abikum, that O oh, group of Quraysh, this is your father's son, Ibn Abikum. Kunu lahu wulatan. And become friends with him. Becomes? Become friends with him. Wali habbihi himatan. And support him in his battles. Wallahi la yas'aluka ahadun minkum sabilahu illa rashada. By Allah, no one seeks to follow his way except he is guided. And whoever takes his path, whoever takes this path becomes fortunate, succeeds. That's the, some of the last statements that he's saying. That follow him. If you follow, his gui if you follow you'll be guided. And if you take his guidance, you'll be successful. So he himself believed that this is guidance that he's brought. This is, and what the ulama say, why he may not have declared completely, explicitly in front of them, why he may not have said a statement explicitly in front of all the way, the wisdom behind, again, was to protect the Prophet ﷺ. That they might increase their enmity towards the Prophet ﷺ. And then there's, um, this narration has been mentioned in other books of Sira as well. But Sira ibn Hisham mentions that in the Sira of ibn Hisham and Imam ibn Ishaq and other books of Sira, that at the time when the Prophet ﷺ asked his uncle to recite the Shahada and declare faith, 
in the seerah of Ibn Hisham, when the Prophet ﷺ then moved away, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Abbas, he put his ears next to the mouth of uh, Sayyidina Abu Talib, put his uh, ears next to him, and he said to the Prophet ﷺ that, uh, Ya ibn akhi, wallahi laqad qala, he said, Oh my nephew, by Allah, surely my brother has said those words which you commanded him to say. Whatever you asked him to say, he said it. The Prophet والسلام, says, I did not hear it. So upon this, the ulama say that because there is a testification to say that he did, therefore, you know, we um, make uh, an affirmation here but again the, as the last thing that we say is Allahu Allah Allah and his Rasul know best in regards to this so best thing is so the Qara'in and Shawahid are there some of the uh, signs are there for his, his faith but the best position to take stay silent Sukut remain silent upon this matter that's the safest position to take I've told you what my personal inclination and what I, my heart is inclined towards is that he did have faith. But the best and the safest position is remain silent upon this issue. Do not make it a discussion amongst people. Don't make it a discussion in your talks. That shouldn't happen. Because you have to respect the fact that there is a disagreement. There is a difference of opinion. And you have to respect that difference of opinion. Your own personal opinion is your personal opinion. And like I said, the mutaqaddimin, some of the great scholars had the opinion of negation of the faith. And then in, 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 in the later scholars, in the contemporary, there are great scholars who hold the opinion that he did. So the safest position is remain silent upon this and do not make it a discussion in public uh, talks and seminars. I only gave examples only just to uh, the reason why my heart is inclined towards uh, that. So, the beloved uncle of the Prophet والسلام, passes away. And the Prophet والسلام, was very, very grieved by this. Very grieved by this. And then a few days later, or a few, uh, or a month later, who else passes away? The beloved wife of our Prophet والسلام, Sayyidah Khadija al-Kubra, Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she also passes away. After 25 years of marriage with the Prophet والسلام, at the age of 65, she also passed away. Now both of these people, they were beloved to the Prophet والسلام, and they were both a means of comfort for our Prophet والسلام, in this dunya. They both supported the Prophet والسلام. They both helped our Prophet والسلام, assisted him. Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha always uh, from from the beginning, she sacrificed everything for our Prophet ﷺ. And, she, and the Prophet ﷺ would come home after a hard day of work and tabligh, after all uh, of the taunting and mocking and persecution of the mushrikeen, he would come home and he would be, she would be there to comfort him. She was one of the richest women of Arabia. But she spent everything for our Prophet, sacrificed everything for our Prophet ﷺ. When the first revelation came, we also find there the way she consoled our Prophet Ali. So when the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I fear that I cannot fulfill this responsibility that Allah has given me. And what did she reply? She said, Wallahi, your Lord shall never leave you. He will never abandon you. He won't abandon you. Then she mentions the good uh, characteristics of our Prophet Ali. You help the weak. You support those who are downtrodden. You're honorable to the guest. You are someone who stands firm upon the truth. So she mentions these things to the Prophet ﷺ. So throughout her life. And in return, the Prophet ﷺ, when she leaves, Rasulullah would always remember her. Always remember her. And he would uh, remember how she favored the Prophet ﷺ. How much she had done for him. And he would say that she, uh, at a time when people weren't believing in me, she believed in me. At a time people were rejecting me, she was accepting. 
At a time when no one wanted to help me, she was helping. The Prophet does not recount these favors. And he would also join ties of kinship with her relatives. And he would give gifts to her friends and her relatives. So he kept that. Why? He remembered that my beloved wife, did. He, she sacrificed everything for me. So this was the second most beloved or, or, uh, person to the Prophet to pass away in that year of Amr Huzan. So we had the three years of boycott, the suffering and hardship in that. And then in that year, the 10th year after, the, in that same year, both of these beautiful personalities and beloved to they leave this world. This then became known as the Amul Huzan. Then after this, what happens? The Prophet when, when the uncle of the Prophet left this world, the Quraysh saw this as an opportunity. The Mushrikeen saw this as an opportunity to harm our Prophet The harming became even more intense. Now obviously they wanted to completely kill the Prophet but Allah had protected him. Wallahu ya'simu ka minan nas. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, what did he do? He said, let me go outside of Makkah al-Mukarramah and go propagate to people outside of Makkah. So where does he go? He goes to Ta'if. Now what happens in Ta'if, you're all familiar with, when he goes to Ta'if to propagate to these people. Now Ta'if, this city, the, rich, the elite people used to live there. The rich people used to live there. So even the Makkans, even the Quraysh were wealthy, they would invest in Taif. They would invest in Taif. So it was the elite class used to live there. So the Prophet والسلام, these people may be more intelligent. They were educated. Even people who wanted, who were a bit well off, you know, like you send people to private schools. Some people send their children to private schools for good education. Those who can afford it. So those who were uh, elite of uh, Makkah Sharif or Saran, they would send their children to Taif to get educated. So when the Prophet ﷺ goes to Taif with hope, what happens there? They begin to mock the Prophet ﷺ. They begin to taunt the Prophet ﷺ. They then tell the, uh, the young people and the children to pick up rocks and stones and Helped our Prophet والسلام, and chase him out of the city of Taif. Rasulullah وسلم, injured in some narration it mentions he was on his own, in others it mentions he was with his uh, beloved uh, companion who used to be the servant of the Prophet وسلم, as well, Sayyidina Zayd bin Haritha. He was with him as well. So they both stoned and pelted, injured, bleeding, and the books of Sirah mention that their sandals were filled with blood because of this. The Prophet والسلام, rests. Allah does what? Allah sends the angels of the mountains. The ones who have authority upon the mountains. Jibreel والسلام, comes to the Prophet والسلام, Your Lord has seen what these people have said and done to you. He has sent these angels and is asking permission. Give permission to these angels to completely destroy all of this city and the people in it between these two mountains. Allah sent them. Look at the, that connection between Allah and His beloved. That love between Allah and His beloved Prophet Even at that time, Allah sends for the comfort of the Prophet These angels are at your command. If you give the command, if you give permission, they will destroy this entire city between these two mountains. What does the Prophet ﷺ reply? He says, "Bal arju an yukhrij Allahu min aslabihim min yabudullah wahdahu la yushriku bihi shayya." The Prophet ﷺ said, "Rather, I am hopeful that Allah will take out from the children or the offspring in the generations to come of these people." people who will be believers and will not associate anything with Allah. That's what I hope. And that's what I want. And he makes dua for those people. The angels, what do they reply to this? As mentioned in the books of Sirah, what do they reply to this? Anta samma ka rabbuk 
Rauf ur Rahim. They said, Surely, your Lord, the name that He has given you, surely that name upon you, the names upon you, Rauf and Rahim. They are, this is why Allah has given you these names, Rauf and Rahim. In the Quran, Allah mentions, in the end of Surah Tawbah, Allah Ta'ala mentions these two names of the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, Rauf and Rahim. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَعَانِدْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ The compassionate and the merciful. So surely your Lord has given you these names of Rauf and Rahim. And this is the reason. After all of this, you're still making dua for them. The Prophet was hopeful. What has happened? Allah listened to that dua, accepted that dua. People are Muslim there. And I remember growing up, our teachers used to tell us, you will find in Ta'if that the, the environment and the, and the atmosphere in Ta'if is different to the rest. And they say the reason for that is because of the du'as of the Prophet ﷺ in that place. So Ta'if happened. Now, after Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ was given comfort before this journey as well. If these people won't believe, on the Prophet ﷺ way back, he stopped at a place called Nakhla. And this was the place where Allah sent jinns to listen to the Prophet ﷺ recitation of the Quran. And this is mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn in the 29th Juz and Surah Al-Ahqaf in the 26th Juz, where a group of jinn came and they listened to the recitation of the Quran of the Prophet and they became Muslim and they did bear out the hand of the Prophet Ali's and then they went back to tell the other jinns that a Prophet has come and believe in him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say if these people don't believe then there is a makhluk who will believe. <laughs> and the jinns became, so that was another comfort for our Prophet Ali. Don't worry about these people. If they don't believe you there's other makhluk of Allah. The jinns believed in the Prophet Ali salatu wasalam. And then, when the Prophet ﷺ comes back to Makkah al-Mukarramah, when he comes back under the protection of one of the tribal uh, leaders who later became uh, Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, he thought, let me try giving tabligh to people who come from other parts towards Hajj. So when they would come towards a pilgrimage to visit the Kaaba, the Prophet ﷺ would begin to do tabligh. One of the so there were some influential people who then became Muslim from other tribes. One of those famous people were Sayyidina Tufail Amr bin Dawsi radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Tufail was a very influential figure in his tribe of Dawsi. He comes and he's heard that there is a person who has claimed he's a prophet. But he has no interest at the moment to meet him. So what the disbelievers do, what the mushrikeen do, they begin to brainwash him beforehand. Because they know he's an influential person and they know that the Prophet wasalam, because they used to also, they know that he is truthful. They know that he's a prophet, but it was their enmity towards him, the personal grudges that was not allowing them. So they began to tell him, don't listen to this person, he's a magician, he's this. If you hear about him, you know, he works his magic, Billah. So when he was there for a few days, he's listening to this. So what does Sayyidina Tufail do? He says, I put some cotton wool in my ears in order to block them so I don't hear the words of the Prophet. So I don't, because they're telling me he will completely change you and you will leave your, the religion of your forefathers. So he says, I put things in my ear to block out any noise. But he says, suddenly I saw a person praying. This enlightened face person praying. And Allah, even though I had these things in my ears to block out, he said, the sound was still coming in. I could hear his recitation. Allah made me hear it. And he said, I, that pierced into my heart straight away. He says, I began to then speak to the Prophet ﷺ. And he completely changed me and he gave bear to the Prophet ﷺ right there. Say that to fail. And then because of him, because of him, he went back to his tribe. Because of him, over a hundred people became Muslim. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ, Allah gave him. 
After hardship, there will be ease. These people don't accept. Don't worry, there's people, there's other people. Then after that, what happened? The, the people from Medina then came. The Al Aqaba pledges. Six people came, then 12 people came, then approximately 70 people accepted Islam. Then it was, then the night of Mi'raj took place. The night of Al Isra. Either it was before the Aqaba pledges, the people of Medina, or it was after. There's ikhtilaf of the ulama because there's a disagreement of which year it took place in. Some say one year uh, before, some say two years before. So some in the books of Sirah have mentioned this afterwards, some have mentioned it before. But the circumstances that we see where this night journey takes place, all of these circumstances and, and the situation of hardship on our Prophet ﷺ, to give him hope, to give him comfort, to console him. And through that we find the Prophet ﷺ, through his suffering, through his hardships, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has comforted the Ummah of the Prophet. Through the sacrifices of all of these people, through the sacrifice of our Prophet ﷺ, how this Ummah and, and how the Ummah is given relief from those hardships. And Allah Ta'ala spread the light after the night of Mi'raj, there was hope after hope for the Prophet. Because then he was given permission to go to Medina. He said, leave these people. Go to Medina to Munawwara. When he goes to Medina, this was a new phase. So after the Mi'raj, Medina Sharif. And that was a new phase for the, um, for the, for the mission of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, where it went to its peak and the state of Medina was established. All the Ghazawat that took place in Medina Tul uh, Munawwara. So, um, what we take from that and the lessons that we take from that from this journey looking at the circumstances in which the prophet والسلام, was in that how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he never abandons he never abandons those who are close to him and this is the promise of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many places in the quran as well for example allah says inna allah ma'al mu'minin allah is with the believers but this is us that we don't have firmness in our iman. Inna Allah ma'al mu'mineen. Allah says, Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with the ones who are sabirin, who have patience. Allah is with them. That's His promise. Inna Allah ma'al muttaqeen. Allah is with the muttaqeen. With those who are pious, with those who are God conscious, who are conscious of Him. Inna Allah ma'al muhsineen. Indeed, Allah is with the muhsineen, the, the doers of good. So Allah is with us, but it is us who have distanced ourselves from Allah. Allah is close. نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ He is more close to us than our jugular veins. It is us who have created that distance between our Lord and our Prophet alayhi salatu They are close to us. النَّبِيُّ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسِهِمْ The Prophet is more closer to you and dearer to you than yourselves. But we've distanced ourselves from Allah his Prophet ﷺ. And this is why we find ourselves in the turmoils that we have in these um, situations that we find ourselves in, in these fitans that we find ourselves in, where we lose all hope and despair. The people who don't lose hope and despair are those people who have that connection with Allah and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand that. Inshallah, uh, I didn't want to go into the journey itself because uh, we have programs that are coming up, inshallah, related to Al Isra wal Mi'raj on, on, on the Wednesday. Uh, and for sisters, there's one on the Sunday. Uh, so, inshallah, we will speak more about that journey uh, on, on its particular uh, night that it occurred. Jazakumullah khairan wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. This was the final uh, session on, on the Divine Comfort series. But inshallah, we'll be starting another series, especially preparation for the blessed month of Ramadan. So we will be going through some of the essentials of fasting, of zakat, and how we prepare ourselves for the blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, inshallah, we'll be uh, doing a four-part series, I think from next week, inshallah ta'ala. So jazakumullah khairan. Wa akhiru da'wan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Amin. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulihi al-kareem. ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار 
ربنا اغفر لنا ولاخواننا الذين سبقونا بالايمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين امنوا ربنا انك رؤوف رحيم اللهم انا نسالك علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وقلبا خاشعا وتوبه نصوحا وعملا متقبلا وشفاء من كل داء اللهم انصر الاسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر المؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم ربنا يا مولانا واجعلنا منهم واخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم ربنا يا مولانا لا تجعلنا منهم اللهم ارحم امة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم خصوصا في اهل فلسطين اللهم انصر اهل فلسطين اللهم كن لاخواننا اللهم كن لاخواننا المسلمين في فلسطين وسائر العالمين وصلى الله تعالى على خير الكي محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين جزاكم الله خير